Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, study of the letter to the Romans. Uh, my name is John Walker, and I'm sitting with Bruce Watts, that's the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study? We're at the very start of, of the book of Romans. We've basically done an introduction, and we've tried to take a lot of time to try to analyze what was the occasion of this letter. Why did Paul write this letter? Uh, ever since uh, Martin Luther uh, read the book of Romans, and out of it he got the message of justification by faith versus justification by works, and he rebelled against the works-oriented teachings of the medieval Catholic Church, uh, Protestants have tended to just take that theme that Luther got from the book and just see this really as Paul uh, looking for an opportunity to preach his fundamental message of justification by faith. Uh, although I think justification by faith is in there in contrast uh, to human works, I would suggest that the message is much broader than that. It's the whole gospel. That's only part of uh, the gospel. And so we're trying to look into this and to get the greater depth. But, but the things we did determine in our earlier studies was that uh, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, the Jews had been kicked out of Rome uh, in 49 AD and were allowed to come back until 55. And so during that absence, uh, the Gentiles had taken over the leadership and were the overwhelming majority of the Christians in the church at Rome, which presented problems because uh, after initially, uh, after the day of Pentecost reaching a lot of Jewish believers, and Paul and others going into synagogues and reaching a few uh, Jews and God fearers across the world, uh, by the time Paul wrote the Roman letter, the majority of people being converted to Christ were Gentiles. And so the church was becoming increasingly Gentile oriented. And the uh, Jews were feeling uh, a little lost, and there was a tendency that there might be a division in the church where the, some of the Jews would draw back and stay a part of the synagogue and be Messianic believers or in their house churches and insist on all kinds of Jewish practices and days celebrated. Um, and then the other extreme were some of the Gentiles who shared in the Roman anti-Semitic attitudes. Uh, the Romans uh, hated the Jews, despised them. And as a result of that, some of these Gentile converts, especially during the years there were no Jews uh, in Rome, may have been converted to Christ and not quite got the Jewish connection and perhaps had a anti-Jewish attitude. So Paul, uh, as he writes the letter, is fixing to go to uh, Jerusalem, the center of the Jewish Messianic faith, and he's taking with him contributions from Gentile congregations uh, to show their love and hopefully encourage unity between the two groups. Now, the same thing was on Paul's mind in other letters as he fought some of the Jewish false teaching and then Gentile uh, false understandings because the Gentiles were influenced by Greek philosophy and the Jews were influenced by their religious traditions. And so Paul's trying to keep the unity of the church. He knows some of the people in Rome, so he's aware that it's a multi-house church uh, series of congregations and we can uh, only uh, estimate that it's likely that the different house churches represented different groups of people and might have different attitudes towards each other and towards what the gospel meant and what was important. And so Paul is uh, hoping to come to Rome with his letter coming first as a kind of introduction uh, so that uh, uh, he can uh, solidify unity there as well and they will support him as he does mission work in Spain. So that's a, kind of the context of where we are. And actually, I want us to pick up with a few verses we covered at the end of last session, uh, starting in verse uh, 14 uh, of chapter 1, because this is, in the Greek, this is one thought, because it, at the beginning of each sentence after that, it starts with the Greek gar, which means because or for this reason. So each verse is explaining the preceding verse or the preceding verses. 
And so this one connected thought from verse 14 all the way down to verse 20. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And Bruce, what is the connection uh, with, with this verse? And we have uh, uh, other verses coming. Uh, um, well, you notice he starts out with a kind of interesting thing. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks. Well, in the, in the world he lived in, uh, no matter what your original native language was, if you are an educated person, you learn Greek because Greek was the common language of the empire uh, spread by Alexander the Great. And so saying he, uh, he felt an obligation, a debt, to both the highly educated that could speak Greek and to those that were not so educated, to the wise, those that thought themselves wise, and people that they thought were fools because they didn't know Greek, uh, he felt an obligation to all kinds of people. And of course, Spain was one of those places that very few people knew Greek. And so he had to give them a good reason. Why should we go to these uneducated people in their villages that don't even know the Greek language in Spain or any other part of the world? And Paul says, I feel an obligation uh, to them. Why? Because, he says, I feel an obligation. And because of that obligation, that's why I am eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. So he finally sums up, you know, all his introductions. He's talked about uh, why he hadn't come. He's sorry he hadn't come. By saying, I'm eager to come preach the gospel to you. Why? Because you're, you either fall into the educated Greek category or the other. You're wise or you're fool. You're one of those categories. And so since I feel an obligation to everyone, I feel an obligation that I, can, I should preach the gospel to in Rome, even though I didn't plant the church and you're doing just fine and he's not criticizing their faith. Um, that's why. And then, verse 16, because, why is he going to, eager to preach there? Because I'm not ashamed of this message I preach. Now, that sounds a little odd to us. Perhaps we can relate to it in the same way that uh, it's sometimes difficult in a work environment. Uh, it's difficult somebody you just met uh, to suddenly bring up a subject about Jesus or about the Bible. Most people look at you with an odd look and may make you feel ashamed that you're bringing a subject that's inappropriate in this particular environment. Uh, but in the ancient world, some of the core message of the Bible was considered a shameful thing. The cross was a shameful thing. The idea of a bodily resurrection was a ridiculous thing. And so you, the temptation, we find it in Corinth and other places, was to try to remove these uh, parts of the message that people found offensive, that people didn't like, that people made even the members of the church ashamed. And, and Paul will have none of it. We're going to have the full gospel. Uh, because it's the only message, including the cross and the resurrection, that can possibly save uh, the human race. And this is a salvation because of this gospel. It's not just to the Jew, although to them first, they have a certain priority because they are the recipients and the people that have kept the word of God and the truth of the creator God alive for all these years until Christ came. Uh, but it's the power of God that is unleashed within this gospel that brings salvation. And of course, the word salvation, oftentimes we think in very individualistic terms. Uh, I'm saved, you're saved. But uh, the biblical sense is probably broader than that, the idea of the salvation, yes, of you as an individual, but you, as you become a part of the people group, the new people group, the Christ community, that's where you're going to be saved. And salvation is not complete until Jesus comes again or you die and go to meet the Lord. Salvation is a process of saving us as it transforms us uh, because of the message. And so he says it's for the 
Jew first, but it's also for the Gentile. Because, at the next verse, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So, again, we talked a little bit about this last week, but the, the righteousness is a kind of word, that, you know, one of those $100 religious words that most people don't know what to do with. But it has a possible meaning of several things, but I think the essence of it is the idea of justice. The idea that, that it's God's justice and righteousness. So what is that? It's God setting the world right. It's God punishing the wicked and rewarding the righteous. It's God acting to bring ultimate justice uh, into the world. And so he says, this gospel reveals the justice and righteousness of God. Matter of fact, this gospel is from beginning to end uh, of this righteousness is about, uh, it's one that begins and ends with faith. Because again, it's going to, it has to be believed. Uh, it has to be heard and believed. Uh, but this righteousness, as we noted last week, he ends with a quote from Habakkuk 2. And the whole book of Habakkuk is where the prophet questions the justice of God. Is God just allowing morality to go on in the people of God? Well, he said he's going to bring justice by letting the Babylonians conquer them. And then the prophet said, that doesn't sound just either. The righteous will have to suffer with the wicked. And so God said, you know, the righteous will just have to learn to live by faith. You're going to have to put your faith in me that I am going to accomplish my justice and my purpose in history even though in the short run it may appear to you to be unfair or unjust. In the end, the justice of God will be done. Now, this raises, of course, an important question. Um, we know the Jews had the law, the word of God, and so they had been heard this law read over and over again, so they had a clear, written heard and hopefully understood a message from God about what God expected, what the will of God was. But what about the Gentiles? Gentiles didn't have uh, the word of the law, or the word of the prophets. Uh, they uh, lived on their own wits with whatever wisdom uh, that they could develop. And so the question becomes, well, how is God going to judge the Gentiles. And, I mean, how can God be just and punish the Gentiles if they didn't know what's right and wrong? Uh, it'd be like somebody newly came to this country and, you know, they came from a country where you walked places and they'd never been on major roads with uh, signals and things on it and signs that tell you where to go and they suddenly get on the highway and they look at the, they see the speed limit sign and think it's telling how many miles to where they're going and and they see a, a, a red light and they just think, well, isn't that, is that a Christmas light? You know, and they drive through uh, the intersection. And so the whole question would be, well, sure, of course the Gentiles are, are doing wrong things. They just don't know any better. And so how can God ultimately be just and hold them accountable? But on the other hand, if God doesn't hold them accountable, think of all the horrible things that have been done by the Gentiles. That wouldn't be just either. So the question is, how can God be just and judge the Gentiles? You, Paul, say you're an apostle to the Gentiles, so you explain it. And that's exactly what Paul begins to do. He starts in verse uh, 18, and he goes all the way over to chapter 2, verse 16, explaining how God is just in judging, not just the Jews, but judging the Gentiles. Now, if you read verse 18 through 20, this actually is a continuation of the, of the because statements we read earlier. Uh, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them for since the creation, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been 
made so that people are without excuse. Interesting. So the bottom line, he says, this is why people are without an excuse. All right. Then. So what is it? So it's this gospel reveals God's justice and righteousness. All right. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Now, the average person today would have to raise their hand and make an objection. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean the wrath of God? This is the good news. That's what gospel means. How is wrath good news? Well, again, we're talking about justice. And uh, when you go, if you were to go to a court, uh, a criminal court, uh, you expect to see justice done. And justice means that the guilty are punished and the people that are not guilty are declared not guilty. Uh, that's what you expect. That's justice. And so we have a complicated legal system with uh, attorneys for the state and attorneys to represent uh, the person that's accused. We have juries to hear uh, the evidence, a judge to uh, organize the event and make sure nobody gets out of line and to make sure it's done according to the law. And we built a complicated system. But the point is, you wouldn't expect to go into court and somebody shows up and the judge, you know, simply looks out at the person and says, you know, I, I know it was probably a rough day for you, you know, you probably weren't feeling well, you know, the day you killed your mom, but, you know, everybody makes mistakes and, you know, we don't want to be hard on you. Let me give you a hug. You probably need a hug. And the hug say, well, listen, you know, just try not to kill any more mothers. You know, would, would, would we have any respect for that kind of justice? Uh, or some, in, uh, some partiality, oh, well, I'm no, I know your uncle so-and-so. Well, you know, just try not to do that again. And, uh, we'll give you a $5 fine and let you go. You know, that's not justice. And so God starts off with his anger, which in the Old Testament is associated with his punishment. Uh, God is not easily angered. Uh, but when he's angered, it's about injustice. It's about things being done that are evil. And it's not just individual people warping their own character, but it's the kind of bad behavior that people do that harms others uh, that are innocent. These are the things that people must be held accountable for. And so he starts off with wrath. But then the wrath of God uh, does occur like what we think. You know, like we think the next paragraph would be, you know, or the next verse would say, when you see lightning strike people, it's very obvious that they've done something wrong. God's taking them out. You know, when you hear thunder, you know, if you've done the wrong thing, you can run, but you can't hide. Uh, or God's going to cause you to have a heart attack because you're a bad person. But good and bad people have heart attacks and get struck by lightning. Um, that's not the wrath of God. Matter of fact, the wrath of God that's being revealed, he said, is kind of unusual. And he really picks it up in verse 24. He says, therefore God gave them over. And then later, verse 26, because of this, God gave them over. Uh, and then in verse 28, the second half of that verse, so God gave them over. Um, you see, the wrath of God is being revealed on earth to the Gentiles and everyone else in that if you decide to be rebellious, you decide to that the will of God isn't a good thing, that being moral isn't for you, that you can do whatever you want, you want absolute freedom to do what you want, one of whatever desire occurs to you, you want to fulfill it no matter what it costs you or other people, then what God does to rebels is he gives them over. He doesn't protect them. He allows them to experience the natural consequences of their behavior. Now think about that. Uh, you know, sometimes as parents, you do your best to instruct and teach kids, but sometimes kids never learn a lesson until they go out, act like a rebel, and get in trouble or hurt themselves. And then they go, oh, well, that's why, you know, the parents said I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that. You know, there's, there's the way of instruction, easy way, or the hard way. One way or another, you're going to learn. And so God's, you know, God wants to send out a word to instruct us, but if we're 
pig-headed and we're stubborn and we're willing to do our thing, then God's willing to let us suffer the consequences for our behavior. And unfortunately, not only we suffer, but other people suffer from our bad behavior. And we suffer from other people of uh, bad behavior. And therefore, we live in a world uh, that's potentially very dangerous in our interaction. People can you know, take you for money. People can harm you physically. Uh, people can treat you with disrespect. On and on you go. Uh, this is the world we live in. The world of the Gentiles was full of that. And lots of violence. And one group of people uh, arming themselves to conquer other people and enslave them. That was the way the world worked. It was an evil way, but it was the way of the world. And so, Paul's not going to address these uh, Gentiles. And he's saying the wrath of God, even to those who don't have the word of God, is being revealed against who? The godless and the wicked. Pretty much, you include every kind of problem in those two. What do they do? Who suppress the truth by their wickedness? What truth? Well, the fundamental truth that there is a God that we are ultimately accountable to. And secondly, the fundamental moral law, what's right and what's wrong. Now, at first, the question that we raised was the Jews had the law. They knew in writing what was right and wrong. They'd been instructed. What about the Gentiles? They didn't have a written law. Well, what did they have? Well, Paul addresses this in uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 14 through 16. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. So, he ends up with a judgment day. But before he begins, the judgment day isn't right away. The wrath of God has to be revealed. But the wrath of God is us suffering the consequences for our foolish, selfish thoughts and behaviors. And that's a warning, you know? If you think this is a good idea and you discover it's horrible, then maybe you're missing the whole point. And that's the point behind God's wrath being revealed before ultimately we are accountable to God in the end. And he said every one of us uh, has a conscience. Every one of us innately know basic right and wrong. You show the law is written on your heart, he says. So the Gentiles didn't magically have it written. But what we would call today is genetically. You know, uh, there are two basic theories about the mind. Uh, one is that you're a blank slate and you don't know anything except what your parents teach you or what you experience and learn. Uh, that's been a popular view, but I think there's a lot of evidence that that's not uh, correct. The other is that we have certain innate knowledge passed down from the generations memories of what our ancestors believed and did and experienced, uh, and also what God gave us to begin with, a basic God consciousness. We're all aware there's a God, and we're also fundamentally aware of right and wrong. That's innate. I think that's genetically there. Um, that doesn't mean a two-year-old could, uh, could explain the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. It just means that it's innate within us and the Greeks understood learning as a bringing out uh, what was already inside. And that's the idea innately of knowledge in here. And by experience and by instruction, you bring out the knowledge that's already there, at least in the area of moral and, and the very area that there's got to be a God. So since these are innate qualities that the Gentiles have along with the Jews, uh, then they can be held accountable. Like he said, their consciences will argue for them or against them on that final day when God judges the world through Jesus Christ. That's going to be important. God not just judges the world, but the gospel is about Jesus Christ, and there's a hope for sinners. There's a hope for rebels uh, because of Jesus Christ. 
<clears throat> so this is what uh, philosophically is called natural law. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Constitution is based on that. When it says we have certain inalienable rights, that assumes they're inherent, they are innate uh, to human beings. So there are certain innate rights, there are certain innate knowledge, and uh, that's what he's making the point of. Now, our experience will bring that knowledge to the forefront, and that's what he talks about next. Because what may be known about God is plain. Most translations have to them, because God made it plain to them. That's a possible translation, but the Greek word can be in, or with, or to. But I think he's saying something a little different. I would translate it, because God made it plain in them. Because God made it plain in them. So he's emphasizing that there's an innate knowledge. God's make it plain uh, to them that he's the creator God. And then he says, for since the creation of the world, the invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So the people without excuse. So he's saying when we all come as human beings and experience the created world and its creatures and, and with the cosmos and the earth that we live on, there's something about that that tells us it needs a creator. You know, there's a designer of this. And we see down to the most minuscule levels of DNA is a very complicated design. All the way up to the spiraling of galaxies. All of them have the fingerprints of a designer, not of chaos. And so the point that he's making is that we're all without excuse when we become of age, old enough to be able to experience this universe and intuitively reaffirm our fundamental belief there's got to be a creator God. Now what are we going to do about that? Well, the wisest thing is to seek for that God. And then we have certain moral innate knowledge to follow that knowledge and not violate our conscience. And so that's the way of the Gentile in contrast to the Jew. And of course the Jew is saying, well, we're, we're better off. Some ways they were. They have a written law. But as Paul will address later, well, it didn't necessarily work for them uh, all the time. And so he's making his point, everybody's without excuse. So the Gentiles have no excuse because God has made it plain in them. He has created a world that, that only fools can say, um, as the Bible says, only a fool says there is no God. Let's pick up at verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over into their in the simple desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Bruce, what is the, the, the root sin for, for all of us here? Yeah, so it's interesting. Paul goes right to the heart. What is the sin behind all other sin? What is the root sin behind uh, the branches of all kinds of sin, uh, things that are wrong and clearly harmful. And Paul affirmed, as did uh, his Jewish uh, contemporaries, that idolatry is the fundamental core sin. To put something other than God to be idolized, to be worshipped. Uh, and, and to put anything there uh, is to make a fatal mistake um, because you can never rise higher than that which you worship. And if you're not going to worship the creator of God, then you worship things, either ideologies human beings work up, or, or you worship certain human beings, celebrities, or what they think, or, or powerful fi military figures, or whatever, uh, or like ancient people did, you worship the 
various than the snake god or some other form, or like many do today, you know, I only have one reservation about some of our uh, environmental movement. I think some of them uh, have paganized their way to the environment, and they are basically worshipers of the physical creation. And uh, they go to great ex extremes um, to try to preserve nature, sometimes in ways that are very detrimental uh, to human life and animal life. And my point on that is they're worshiping the created thing. Now, as a true believer in the creator God, from the very beginning in Genesis 1, he gave us responsibility over the creatures and the physical creation. So we have a responsibility to take care of the environment, uh, to take care of the creatures that live in the environment. But we do it from the mandate of our creator, from the fact that we are true image bearers of God, not from the fact we worship nature. To worship nature will cause you to make fatal uh, flaws in your thinking. And as we see, uh, I think some in the environmental movement have gone uh, to such extremes. Now, he's going to make his case for this. And so he said, all right, I've established that everybody knows there's a God. So although they knew God, and this is the Gentiles he's speaking to, the ones outside the Jewish faith who didn't have the word of God, uh, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. If you think about it, the most fundamental mistake we make is glorifying the wrong thing and not being thankful. For example, people that don't glorify God tend to glorify themselves or glorify some other person or glorify some cause, uh, but not God. God is the one that needs to be recognized as the one, the glorious creator. We were made to worship him, which doesn't mean it demeans us. The opposite is true. It's what gives us our human dignity. It's what gives us our purpose. It's what makes us valuable. And he's going to make that point very clear. But if you aren't grateful and you fall into idolatry, what happens? Their thinking becomes futile and their foolish hearts will darken. Now it doesn't mean if you're an idolater uh, that you can't do advanced mathematics doesn't mean that you can't get a degree in advanced science or other fields of learning. It's saying in the area of there being a creator God and the moral law of God that's inherent within us, that's where our thinking becomes futile. And that's where so many people, unfortunately, when you're rebelling against God, you use your reason to rationalize bad behavior. And so he says, not only that, but it corrupts your heart, darkens your heart. You know, in the dark, you can't see much. And so this is a part of human sympathy. You know, people that, that reject God and reject the moral law, they, they do lots of selfish and foolish things that are very harmful to other people. But they learn not to care. They learn not to feel anything, not to be bothered by it. This is a darkened heart, coupled with futile thinking. Although they claim to be wise, and this, of course, is unfortunate. You know, in the Greek world, the great philosophers were seeking after wisdom, uh, and yet their moral behavior was quite bad in many areas. Uh, they became fools. And, of course, the Bible uses the word fool in the most extreme sense, a moral fool, one who intentionally rejects all discipline, all moral truth, and is simply out for purely selfish ambition and does the most evil and selfish things possible. The fool. The fool has exchanged the glory of the immortal God. So here you have the creator God that made this vast cosmos that, that programmed us down to the DNA in the most complex way and made such a beautiful world for us to live in and created this great universe that hopefully someday we'll get to explore further and find more of 
about what the Creator has made out there. But all of that depends, uh, all of that depends on whether we exchange Him for something else. And here's the bottom line. All of us are worshipers. What we worship may be different, but all of us are worshipers. Now by that I mean all of us have certain things that are important to us. Whatever is the most important that you'll go for versus other things, that's your God. That's your idol. That's what you worship. Now, of course, for most of us, we're not monotheists. We don't believe in just one idol. We're polytheists. We believe in many gods. And so in our society, people worship sports. They worship celebrity. They worship money and wealth uh, that comes along with it. They worship sex. You know, they worship success, uh, however they want to define that. Uh, they worship uh, ideologies of various types that they, that they allow to be the most important thing in their lives. And so, consequently, whenever we worship something lesser than God, bad consequences begin to occur. So here, here we are as people in our most, our smallest unit, us, in a family where it would be to our best interest to get along. People don't get along. Why don't they get along? Because of sin. Because we are rebels. Because we're full of foolish thinking. It destroys our relationships. Harms other people. We don't see how we do it. When other people accuse us, we try to justify our behavior. This is the sinful way. And so it it seeped into every dimension. It affects society at large. It affects us even as individuals. And we oftentimes love and hate ourselves over what we think and what we do. And so it's a terrible thing to not put the Creator at the center of our reality. And so when we do this, one of the key things, and he goes on, notice he em emphasizes sexuality. And I think the reason why he emphasizes sexuality is if you choose to worship among the creatures, what is the highest level of animal? Human being. Right? So you would worship them. Well, if you're going to worship them, you have to worship the form, the male and female form, uh, and that leads to uh, a sexual drive. Instead of it being in the covenant of marriage, it's just generic drive uh, for sex. And so when we, when we abandon the worship of the true God, God gave them over, it says, to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And so instead of it leading to some glorious future uh, sexual freedom, it's led to degradation. Um, you know, if you are to look at uh, the extremes our society has gone to, uh, the brutal forms of pornography and other things where people are, de uh, bodies are degraded and humiliated and mistreated and, yeah, it's horrible. This, but this is what happens when you rebel against the Creator God. You have lost your true identity. You see, we are image bearers of God. But if there's no God, then we bear no image. Then we are just animals. And if we're just animals, we are led by our desires. And the sexual desire, greed, uh, other kinds of desires become the controlling uh, facts of our life. And so it leads to this. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. So inevitably if we don't worship God and we don't have a knowledge of the true God, and we don't stay true to our conscience and moral guide um, we end up losing our humanity. Why do you think uh, people can murder people without a second thought. Because they cease to be human in their own minds. And you have no human dignity or worth. Uh, it's only because we are creating the image of God and God 
loves us, that we have great value and great dignity. Every human being does. But without God, we have no inherent dignity. We just have to fight like the other animals do for superiority, for control, for dominance, for food, for sex, for whatever. We're just a bunch of animals loose on the planet with a little bit advanced minds that sometimes tell us we're really not headed the right way. But God gave them over. If we are intent in escaping the belief and the understanding of a creator God, if we're intent on throwing off all moral restraint, God will let us, but not without consequence. 20th century should be a lesson to us. You know, starting back in the 1600s began the great enlightenment of scientific rationalism and, the, and we were, through science and reason, we were going to produce this wonderful world you know, where we get rid of all the religious faith and all these superstitions and we produce this wonderful world. What kind of world do we produce in the 20th century? Two world wars that slaughtered millions of soldiers for no good purpose and many innocent civilians, uh, ones in which uh, no respect was shown for people of a Jewish uh, background or even other people the Nazis decided to put with them and considered uh, worthless. They just executed, considered having no worth. Uh, and then we had, in the place of Christianity, communism other ideology. Something's got to spring up. And the two great examples of communism are Stalin who murdered millions of his own people for economic purposes. And uh, Mao murdered millions, starved, intensely starved millions of his own because he thought we got too many Maos to feed. It was starving. This is a loss of worth of the human person in the minds of some. And when you take the creator God, who's the one who gives us dignity because we're made in his image, you take that out of the equation, you can try to talk about human value. But really, you're just talking to animals. Are you going to tell the lion, now listen, you know, if you would, you know, not be so vicious towards these other males, and lions and share the pride uh, with him. You know, the two of you can fight off these others. But if you don't, you're going to get killed. And this really isn't best for you. A lion will look you right in the eye. If he doesn't eat you, uh, he's going to go right on doing what he's always done. And when we don't listen to God, we're the same. And inevitably follow our instincts to our own destruction. And so that's what he's saying. How, how can God hold them accountable? They knew better. They were without excuse. They chose the road of rebellion. They rejected moral restraint. And they reaped the whirlwind. And he illustrates this most specifically with sexuality because that is the most personal of all sins that human beings can get involved with when they worship the body. In verse 26, Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Uh, clear allusion uh, to homosexuality. Homosexuality is not something new. It's been around uh, in the human race uh, forever. Uh, Nero was the emperor at the time Paul wrote this, and he married one of his boyfriends. And so this is, this is, not, uh, this is not a new uh, set of ideas that popped out of uh, uh, nowhere. Uh, but you see, there are two ways to look at this. The people that are seeking absolute freedom to do anything they want, and to be anything they choose, increasingly go to greater extremes and to create greater and greater chaos 
and to get further and further away from what we are intended to be. And again, it's about identity. See, many who practice homosexual activity, that's their identity. They've made that into their identity. I'm homosexual. We have a homosexual culture. Da, da, da. Well, you know, the communist culture, all kinds of cultures that are formed. But the sad, there's a great sadness in all of this. When God gives us over reluctantly because we don't want to uh, honor him, we don't want to thank him, and we don't want to serve him, we end up degrading ourselves, humiliating. We end up doing all kinds of things that are harmful to us and harmful to other people and that lead, don't lead to life. Uh, all you take is one generation that chose to be homosexual and the human race would cease to exist because we were not intended not to have children and there are no children that come naturally out of a homosexual relationship. So it's unnatural in that sense. Now, Paul's not trying to say, you know, what I try to say, this is worse sin than any other kind of sin you... No, it's along the line of the typical kind of sins in the sexual area. Uh, the Bible would say a husband unfaithful to his wife sins in the sexual area. So he's in the same category with the homosexual. Or the person that doesn't get married and is profligate in their sexual activity without making a covenant of marriage, that too would be in the same category as homosexual. It's all under the category of pornea, the Greek word for sexual immorality. And so there's a certain absurdity to homosexuality that Paul is pointing out. But he isn't saying it's a greater sin. But it does point out a loss of identity. And you look at our culture, you know, it didn't stop, did it, with uh, a lesbian identity and male homosexual identity. Now there are all kinds of letters. Letters keep increasing. As people, I can be anything I think I am, you know, and so, again, they're creatively coming up with various sexual identities for themselves. All they're doing is losing their humanity and losing themselves. And People say that Christians don't believe in science. And then they'll take a male, completely male, physical body and claim that he, he, he's a woman. A physical woman and she claims that she's a man. You talk about the denial of biology. Um, but you see, your thinking becomes futile when you rebel against the Creator. It doesn't make any sense. The same people holding up the values of rationality and science do irrational, contrary to biology things that result in absurdity. That's what Paul is talking about. And Paul, I'm sure, felt the same way that I do about this. I have many people that I've befriended over the years as part of the homosexual lifestyle. And uh, I cared for them and I've counseled with them and studied the Bible with them. Some of them were able to break free uh, from uh, this sexual addiction, as I recall. But some fell back into it. They haven't ceased to be my friends. I still love them and care for them. I just feel a deep sadness about where they are because they are losing day by day uh, their humanity because they've lost their identity uh, and caught up in a sexual rebellion against the moral law of God. And so I think this would be a good place for us to end uh, tonight. We've introduced the root sin of all sin, and then we've seen how it tends to create other sins because of the loss of identity. Who am I? If you can't answer that question, you're in big trouble. And without God, you can't come up with a good answer. It's not about your ethnicity. It's not about your gender or some made-up gender. Uh, it's not about uh, the language you speak, not the country that you came from. All of those things are inferior identities.
But our real identity, all of us, are intended to be image bearers of the one true God. That's where our identity is. And that's what Christ is all about, trying to restore our human identity so that we can live like real human beings as God created us and God intended. And so that's my wish for each one listening today, that they'll discover their real identity, which is in Christ. Amen. Thank you, Bruce, for guiding us in our, in our study tonight. And I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us again uh, in our study of the letter to the Romans. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, we're so grateful to you for uh, you being God and calling us to be your people and that we can answer a call uh, in faith uh, and become your forever children. We pray that we continue uh, and always look to be better image bearers of you through your son, Jesus Christ, that we may be heaven bound souls when we are resurrected to you. Let us continue to lead lost souls home to glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone.